Hello, you're on the road, let's travel with Gary Hill and Gigi's Boo, RealLibertyMedia.com, RLM Radio, complete with a big chat room with a whole lot of people in it, lots of folks in there, I won't belabor that, it'd be very tedious to read all the numbers of people who are in the chat room, but if you want to find out for yourself, you can go to RealLibertyMedia.com and log into the chat room, I'm sorry, R-E-A-L, RealLibertyMedia.com, and you probably would like to go there to see all the neat folks and the great conversations that are going on inside there. Yeah, and I think Gigi's booze here. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How's everybody tonight? Hope y'all are doing well. Yeah, hope everybody's doing okay doing okay and we got a lineup of things to go over tonight i think before we do that i think Gigi's boo has got some things here she's going to talk about some aspects of preparedness and i got a couple of things that we had left over from last week about along those same lines and some other stuff but i want to bring something to your attention if you, and i think you all know it or at least perhaps probably intuitively but I want you to I want you to understand what it's like to see demonic oppression at work. I think all of you see elements of it all the time, and you see it in the current events. You see it in what's going on politically and all these things. But what you, what you don't understand is how, as Hal points out in his show behind the woodshed from three to five here prior to ours, that you're dealing with an evil genius. It's a genius that knows us better than we know ourselves. And it knows how to manipulate us and put us at odds with one another. And we see that all the time. We see that politically, personally, all across the board. And it starts to make me wonder sometimes, you know, why do we do all this? And if you remember the Matrix Matrix series, the trilogy, at the end, you had the showdown between Agent Smith and Neo. And Agent Smith is asking the question, why, why, why do you persist? Why, Mr. Anderson, why do you persist? Well, the simple answer to that is, is because it's all part of the equation. If you put it in the terms of the architect, it's all part of the equation. See, Agent Smith and Neo were diametrically opposed equals. They stood on either side of the equal sign. So in order for the equation to balance, they had to cancel one another out. And that's how the story ended up. And so this is the very short period in time, in reality, if you will, in existence, where everything is at peace. Is that that moment of cancellation? And from that point forward, things start all over again. Things begin again. The left and the right, the yin and the yang, it all starts anew. I think once we start to appreciate that fact, then maybe it makes it a little bit easier to know that you, you really, as Shakespeare put it, you're on a stage, the world is a stage, and everyone has a part. Anyway, all that fun and games out of the way. Just thought it was a good introductory, so it does. It begs the question, Mr. Anderson, why? Why do you persist? And speaking of things, as this informational highway becomes more narrow all the time, Reddit, after eight years, I had to say goodbye to Reddit. Some of you already know that. But as a result of behaviors associated with this narrowing of the information highway. It seems that over some period of time, eight years, I've been posting different things to Reddit and different subreddits, and suddenly I start to receive messages from uh, mysterious, (laughs) at least I guess he or she takes great pleasure in appearing mysterious and so forth, 
saying simply that you are shadow banned. So every time I try to post something to Reddit, I'd receive a message from this mysterious bang naughty bits is the name. You're shadow banned. So, you know, you start to wonder, well, what exactly are you talking about? So I ask the, ask the questions. What, you know, what are you talking about? And uh, Ella gets these cryptic responses. You know, you're shadow banned. And finally, apparently, it, he or she says, apparently you have pissed off, their words, a moderator somewhere. So you're shadow banned. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'll play. The obvious question is, if I'm shadow banned, how do you see my posts? That suggests to me that you must be a moderator. And I get the answer back. Take a gander over at the sidebar and guess. And then type sigh. I've tried to be nice and let you know that you annoyed the admin somewhere and need to beg their forgiveness for whatever it was. Take care and good luck. So that was about enough. That's about enough of that little silly game. So I wrote back and I said, Agreed. And you have been nice, in quotes, as have I, actually, because slightly imperious, cryptically self-important interactions are on the near side of my red line. But that's one of the byproducts of a virtual reality where people feel secure behind their keyboards and behave in ways that probably would not serve them well in person. While admin somewhere may perceive themselves as deities on some order and somehow feel deserving of genuflection and groveling by those in search of forgiveness, I am not among that number. Yes, while I have discovered where I may, admittedly, through my own ignorance, run afoul of the rules along the way, this entire exercise in passive-aggressive mutual posturing could have been completely avoided by a simple, helpful interaction in the first instance, rather than allowing it to become the mysterious exchange, a behavior somewhat akin to gaslighting that for some unknown reason some of a psychopathic bend do find pleasurable. Having shared all that in a diplomatic manner, to which I am actually rather averse since putting real skin in the game is more in line with my past training and experience, I will say that as a result of all this silly game playing, I find that I have wasted far too much time attempting to contribute to this platform. At the very least, this will allow you to reserve your size for other centers. Again, I thank you for the illumination you provided. Adieu, Gary L. They're bullying you. People are real afraid behind a keyboard. <sighs> but uh, they can't do too much right out. Of course not. And it's true in many avenues. True. Again, talking about the narrowing of the superhighway. In Slate.com, Twitter will start hiding tweets that detract from the conversation. That detract from the conversations. I had to write a little, I guess you'd say, op-ed about that. So, if you don't mind indulging me, I'll read this to you. The kind face of censorship. What does this mean exactly? The article in tweet says, Are you the sort of person who annoys, frustrates, and offends lots of people on Twitter, but manages to avoid technically violating any of its policies on abuse or hate speech? My comment to that, if one isn't technically violating the rules, that means she or he is not violating those rules, right? They go on to write, When Twitter software decides that a certain user is detracting, which I would ask for them to define what detract means in this case, a certain user is detracting from the conversation, all of that user's tweets will be hidden from search results and public conversations until their reputation improves. Comment. How is one's reputation determined? What's the criteria? If not violating the rules, then what's the basis of one's reputation? And they go on to say, and they won't know that they're being muted in this way. See, they're in your face. They tell you now. You won't know that you're being muted in this way. Twitter says it's still working on ways 
still working on ways to notify people and help them get back into its good graces. Why not reach out in the first instance, as I said previously, and notify the user of their diminished reputation and the objective reasons for that diminishing, diminishment, if there is such a word. goes on to write, how will Twitter determine that a user is detracting from the conversation? Its software will look at a large number of signals, such as how often an account is subject to user complaints and how often it is blocked and muted versus receiving more positive interactions, such as favorites and retweets. The company will not be looking at the actual content of the tweet for this feature, just the types of interactions that a given account tends to generate. For example, the Twitter spokesman said, if you send the same message to four people and two of them block you and one reports you, we could assume, without ever seeing the content, that it was generally a negative interaction. Okay, does anyone else see the problem with this? Most tweets are sent publicly, so any number of people similarly situated could collude to block, mute, or complain. Simply put, if someone doesn't like your politics, your race, ethnicity, your Middle Eastern location, or your opinions related to events in such Middle Eastern countries, etc., they need to merely complain, mute, or block, then voila, your tweets are hidden and you don't even know it. And maybe at some point in the unknown future, some Twitter moderator will tell you, oh, by the way, you're shadow banned. I'm not sure why you're shadow banned, but you must be saying things that someone doesn't like. You're not breaking any rules, but that doesn't matter because people don't like or agree with what you're saying, so you're shadow banned. I don't know how you can fix it because we don't actually read the tweets. So maybe just say the opposite of what you've been saying, regardless of whether or not you agree with it. And maybe that'll work. Winston Smith. Okay, Einstein, let's parse all this out. So, one is deemed to be annoying, frustrating, and offensive to lots of people on Twitter, mind you, by not violating any rules. So Twitter, merely based on the sheer number of blocks, mutes, complaints, to which there is no rule violation, remember, simply vanishes your tweets. You're erased simply because users or multiple users tied to a specific special interest group decide that they just don't agree with what you're saying or that you write and run on sentences or that you use a comma gun in your posts or that you're critical of a certain Middle Eastern country. The article goes on to say, in the meantime, their tweets will still be visible to their followers as usual and will still be able to be retweeted by others. They just won't show up in conversational threads or search results by default. So, ladies and gentlemen, this handy little feature conceals the duplicitous censorship from the user and his or her friends so no one might become the wiser. Welcome to the new world. So, Gigi's boo, what you got going on with food and water? We've been thinking a lot. You know, we were talking last week about what we needed to do in an emergency. So, I thought we'd get back to the basis and get back to the basics of why and how we stockpile water. That's the number one thing that you need to prep first. You can live a good long while without something to eat. You can forge, and you can do all kind of things to get food. But water, if you don't have a clean supply of water, you're not going to make it very long. I remember as a child, I would hear how people who were lost at sea, and they would be lost at sea for a good while, and some of them would be so thirsty that they would drink seawater. The seawater was salty, and it was just a vicious cycle, and that always really bothered me. And I guess before prepping became big, my family were known to pray up. We had a couple of water sources that we always kept open, secured one, only the immediate family knew where it was. We had it covered really well where nobody could get to it. There were two other water sources that were pretty well known. Take, for instance, you're having an emergency and you have a water source, but you don't have it secured What's the first thing that's going to happen for centuries? What was the first thing 
that they did to people. They cut their water source off. You can kill them real quick, or you can make them totally insane while they'll do stupid things to try to get water. You need to store water for emergencies. Now, that can be done several different ways. You can store your own. You can buy it. I think I touched on last week when we had a water shortage because of a water line that broke, and it was terrible. People were absolutely frantic because they could not find water. They had to go to the store and buy it, where if they had already been prepared, they wouldn't worry about it. So be prepared. It's the old Boy Scout motto. Oh, that's not politically correct anymore. I don't know what to call them. But anyway, you need to be prepared with water, with a water source or storing water. Now, water can be stored by yourself in containers. And a three-liter Pepsi bottle, pop bottle, whatever you got that is food grade. You can fill it up. You can put so many drops of chlorine in it, store it. That is really good for personal hygiene, bathing. Also, you can use it if you have to to drink. But my suggestion would be if you're going to store water to drink, you get it in smaller things like pop bottles. Store those full. We've got a lot of water stored. And if the water goes out and you need to take a bath, you've got it. If you need to wash your hair, you've got it. If you need to clean something up, you've got it. And you know as well as anybody that if you go without water for a while, your health deteriorates. You can get headaches. You can come lethargic and weak. You'll get dizzy. You'll faint. And eventually you'll die. Now you need to keep it out of the sunlight. We have ours in an outside building where it's dark and we have it secured where nobody can see it because trust me, when it gets down to it and you don't have anything, you are going to have people break in. The first thing they're going to look for is your water source. They're going to take your water and they're going to kill you or leave you without it. So you be very prepared to hide it. And there's all kind of ways you can hide it. Another thing is, if you can't always get water, I would try to get juices that are in low sugar content. Because sugar will make you thirsty. It will go away a lot quicker than a thirst from salt. But you're still going to be thirsty. Don't ever sit back and say, oh, this is never going to happen. Because it will. And don't ever say, oh, the government will take care of us if this happened. Please, please, please don't fool yourself. Ask the Indians. The government's not going to take care of you. How much water do you really need to survive? Okay, so now we've kind of agreed that people need to stockpile water. But the next obvious question is how much? That's going to depend on a few factors. Kind of a general rule of thumb is that you need one gallon of water per person per day. Now, this assumes hydration and hygiene. You won't necessarily drink a gallon of water, but you might need it for reconstituting freeze-dried foods. You need it to wash your cooking utensils, washing your body. On some days, you might not even need a gallon, so you'll save that and add two. On other days, you could end up needing much more than one gallon. And that would come into play if you're exerting yourself physically or if the temperature is elevated and you're losing fluids to perspiration. That happens quicker than what you think. My niece was just out cutting grass, and she just came in and she said, I am as dizzy as a skunk. I noticed that she was a little pale, but her cheeks were flushed washed her a little bit and later on in the afternoon it just got worse and then she stood up and she said I gotta go to the hospital she said I cannot even stand up we got her down there and she's totally dehydrated and they started IVs gave her some freezy pops to eat and she began to get out of it so you will dehydrate quickly and not realize it now in my opinion water is one of the easiest preps cross off your list and it's so vital. Now, to calculate how much you're going to need, just multiply the number of people you're prepping for by the number of days you want to be stocked up. So, say, 12 people, one month, 
depth is 12 by 30. That would be 36 gallons of water you needed to have prepped. It's a lot of water when you think about it. Now, that's only for a month. So what if the emergency lasts longer? And here again, let me stress, if you can have you a secret water source, you need to have it. You need to have it secured where nobody else can find it. You need to have your gas in your car full. You need to have your weapons handy, whatever you choose them to be. I'm being very careful about what I say on here, but whatever you wish them to be, have them ready because trust me, they're going to come after water. You can also do gallons, 55-gallon barrels. You can do that. They do sell them, and you would do as many as you wanted to. Heavy-duty plastic container that holds seven gallons of water. So that's a great way to go. Now, I know they have outlawed in a lot of places catching rainwater. I think that's the most stupid thing I ever heard in my life. If it's raining on your property, you ought to be able to collect it. Very easy to do. One of the easiest things i found that you can keep your rainwater clean is you put a piece of screen over it, and it doesn't hurt to have a couple of goldfish. They keep things down. They catch mosquitoes and things like that. So you can do that, or you can pour it out and restore it into sealed containers. Very good to have that. I don't understand what it is if if it's rainwater. They say that sometimes it's not really good because it comes to the air and you're going to pick up everything. Well, let me tell you something. You can disinfect it again. You can put a little chlorine in it. You can take care of it and you can watch it. And you need to have it as a backup. And a lot of people have it under their gutters. And some people can't afford to do that because of a homeowner's association, and I wouldn't live in a house that had a homeowner's association that dictated what you could put up and what you couldn't. Or some people live in in apartments, and they're not really available to be able to put things out because they do live in tiny spaces. I was looking, while I was looking through this stuff to put on tonight, I was thinking about apartments, even a small apartment. I found an apartment that was so small, it was only 90 square feet. Well, that's unbelievable. I mean, I don't know how you would live in it, but people are paying seven and $800 for that overpopulated cities. And most of them have a small window, but they don't have any way to catch rainwater. So you would think you would need to have a, uh, if you were in an apartment complex, you probably would need a concrete water closet that you could store it in. What happens if your water runs out? That's why I said you got to have an alternative plan for good water. You can buy these life straws. You can get them off of Amazon, eBay. You can see the dirtiest puddle of water you want to find, and you can put it down in there, and it really does clean it. It filters everything out. If you don't have those, you're really going to be at the creek because you're going to have to filter your water. And that takes a little bit of time because you've got to take it through Gravity Works and you can do that in about four liters of water. You fill up a bag and you filter it through some sand and some other water filters and you have about two liters that you can drink later on. I can water You can take water and put it in your jars that have been washed and disinfected and fill your water up. I can put it in the canner, and I bring it under 10 pounds of pressure, and I can it for about 30 minutes under the pressure, take it out, and I know it's clean. And that's very important if you have elders or sick people in your family and you've run out of your bottled water that you already have bottled and put up that canned water, the pressure and the heat alone is going to destroy. And like I said, you can go ahead and you can get bleach to disinfect it. We keep Clorox here all the time. I know it's a chemical, but boy, it will take down viruses and other things that are so bad for us. And you can also get water purification tablets. 
if you can't get that, you can even get iodine. You can put iodine in it and it will be fit to drink. But I would very, very highly recommend that you stockpile water. And like I said, you can really buy up a lot of these jars and things, these mason jars at these stores. And if you couldn't pressure can it, you could water can it for about 45 minutes and it's going to be gone. And when it seals, it's good. But have you some alternatives, have you some life straws, have other things, because you can live a long time without food, but you cannot live without water. We're 90% water anyway, so you got to think about that. Gary, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking about water, how the old trick that was used a long time ago to keep water fresh in a horse trough, you know how that was done? No, go ahead and tell us. They drive a nail on the inside of a horse trough under the water level, drop a silver coin in, and there would be an electrolysis that would occur that would, of course, create the ionic silver, which killed your bacteria and stuff. Hmm. Yeah, silver's a good thing. I I remember you telling me that now about the coin. Yeah, I remember that. Anybody else got any ideas in the chat room, you people that are city dwellers, maybe? Yeah, like there, I said, stockpile it up. There have been a few comments in there, mostly supporting the concept of filtering rainwater and mm-hmm. uh, those sorts of things. And what about the foods to hoard? Oh, yeah. We're going to get to that. I was just kind of seeing if anybody had anything else to add. I'm going to go over about 37 foods to hoard. And I, y'all that have been in our hoarding shows, this is going to be a repeat a lot for y'all. Bear with me just a little bit. This has been a rough week for me. You need 37 foods to hoard before crisis. This means you ought to start it three years ago because it's coming, whether people believe it or not. I've said it before, and I've seen it again. It's coming. It's already happening in a few places already. Can liquids. You need to do those. Canned juice, vegetable juice, they will provide a lot of nutrition and hydration together. Look for evaporated milk or condensed milk. Now, condensed milk is very, very sugary. Coconut milk is good, and coconut milk will help you cook rice faster. Stewed tomatoes and vegetables, beef or chicken stock. And if you don't want to carry the cans of stock, I would suggest that you have the cans of stock to carry with you. But you can also buy the bouillon cubes in chicken and in beef to flavor. But there again, you need water to flavor it. A lot of people stock up on beer. A lot of people have alcohol. Now, I don't drink, but I'm not opposed to anybody that does. But alcohol is a great astringent. And it's also a great painkiller if you've got nothing else. So I would stock up on beer and whiskey. Dehydrated milk, whey, and eggs. You can find these and you can get them with a shelf life of 30 years. They will be good until you open them. You can get them in a can and scoop it out as you need. You can even even get buttermilk and freeze-dried butter and freeze-dried cheese. We've got all that, so you really need to get that. Dehydrated powdered milk, also whey powder. With all this, you can, it's very nutritious, protein concentrate, it's high in amino acids that the body requires for strength and muscle development. You need to think about protein and stuff of that sort because you want to have the protein because that keeps your muscles going. You don't want to lose muscle mass because if you lose muscle mass, you're losing heart capacity and it weakens the heart. You can use all this, this protein powder and this whey powder, and you can make smoothies and shakes. You can mix it with dehydrated milk and it'll be extra frothy. It's very good. So while it's not the first thing that flies off the shelf in in an event, that you needed it, it would be great to have it. Eggs and powdered eggs, you can get those. The Latter-day Saints are great people to buy from because they are great preppers. They have everything already. It's already done. They, I've got a cookbook. And if any of you will drop Gary a private message in the chat room, I'll print you a cookbook that came from the Latter-day Saints, a lady. And it's very, very easy. It's very easy to use. 
and it's very nutritious food too. You need to have cheeses that are encased in wax, and those are not easy to find, but you can get them. Parmesan, Swift, sharp cheddar. That helps to preserve it. It keeps it moist, and you can store it for a very long time without refrigeration. Parmesan cheese is hard cheese, but if you get it in the powdered form that you shake out, the shelf life for it is only about four months. But if you get it encased in wax, get a load of this, it can last up to 25 years. Here is something that you could do. Consider buying cheese wax and make your own delicious cheese, encase them, and then you will have it. It won't uh, mold. It'll go right on. You can use it. And we're big cheese eaters. It also suggested that you do protein bars and protein drinks. Now, I, that's okay for a bug out bag in a hurry. It gives you quick energy and it's got the stuff that you really need for a little bit. But it's full of proteins and granola and all that. And it can satisfy you for a morning meal in addition to your other rations. Look for your coconut oil. Also look for your coconut bars. They're good. Pemison is good. It, it has protein and gives you energies. It does not have too much fructose in it or sugar or cholesterol. It's a concentrated food bar that offers quick energy. Canned and dehydrated meats, poultry, and seafood. Protein is the, the number one thing in food that a prepper should really hoard first because, like I said, protein is very important to the body to sustain it and the muscle mass. Now, when you go to stockpile it in cans, the only thing that I would not do too much with that was out of date, if it was out of date a year, I don't know that I would I would do too much of the fish. But the other stuff, I would eat. When you're looking to have meat that's been canned, I've canned a lot of pork, chicken, deer meat, and beef. Look for grass-fed meats. Now, they named a brand called a Yoder brand. Canned salmon, canned sardines, canned mackerel, and canned tuna. And I'm not crazy about mackerel. I can eat salmon and sardines, but mackerel I don't care too much for, not in a can. Tuna's okay. They're rich in your omega-3 oils. Stock your refrigerator with meats, too, while you can. Eat a lot of smoked salmon, sausage. Now, they say hot dogs, but I stay away from hot dogs because they're full of nitrates and stuff like that. And I don't, I don't do that because I have a tendency to water retention. Drink mixes, coffee, bouillon, tea, tang, coffee for survival. It really boosts your mental alertness. It also boosts your morale. Tea, it's been around for a thousand years, and it's been around for a reason. Water quality of our ancestors wasn't very good, so tea helped it taste better, and boiling water killed bacteria. In an emergency situation, tea can help you hydrate quickly when you can't wait for the boil water to cool. Caffeinated teas provide a burst of additional energy, while other teas can provide a calming and soothing effect that you may need. Additionally, many teas have anti-cancer properties and reduce the risk of blood clotting and even lower your cholesterol levels. On the coffee, I do want to say that coffee does work as a natural diuretic, and they will tell people, a lot of times I have kidney problems to stay away from coffee. Powder drink mixes like Tang enhance the water supply. The NASA astronauts use Tang. It's got calcium and vitamin C, and it helps avoid scurvy. Gator Aid Power has a boost of electrolytes. Now, let me warn you about this. These sports drinks all have potassium and electrolytes, but you can't overdo it. There's a young man I know who lived on the Gatorade, and he drank a couple of the energy drinks, and he felt bad, and he went to the doctor, and his creatine kidney functions were seven. He was in kidney failure. He had to have a kidney transplant because all he drank was the Gatorade and the energy drinks. So 
A little bit is good. A whole lot is not. Kool-Aid, if you like it, get it. And your bouillon cubes. And as I told you, they have a salty essential flavor to it. And it will enhance your soups, rice, noodles, and gravies. But you can buy it that doesn't have any salt. And that's very good, too. You still get the flavor, just not the saltiness. Cooking oils are very essential to stockpile butter, lard, olive oil, and organic shortening. You can get the butter in powdered form, mix it up as you need to use it. Now, they said that there was a butter that was called Red Feather. It has a long shelf life. It's in a can. Now, coconut oil, I use a lot of. Coconut oil is very good. It has many uses. My sister cleans her face with coconut oil. She uses an astringent, and she puts coconut oil on her face as a moisturizer. But it was very, very good for the body. It's uh, heat-stable because it's slow to oxidize. That means it won't go rancid as quickly as the other oils. It can last up to two years. It gives it a wonderful flavor, and it gives you fast energy. Here's something to consider. G. G is butter that's been melted and simmered down until all the water's evaporated and the milk solids have settled at the bottom. It has a long shelf life. Lard, believe it or not, for years they told us that lard was terrible for us. New studies have shown that it's helpful. And it's very versatile, too. Olive oil is an ideal oil, but it can go rancid really quick. So I would not stockpile it. Organic shortening, a lot of people stop Crisco, and it's not organic, but it's really better to make a candle from Crisco than it is to eat it. Organic shortening is a good alternative because it's made healthier and it lasts indefinitely. Try Nativia or Spectrum brands of organic shortening. Now, other oils, it's possible to look for non-GMO corn oil is 86% of corn has been genetically modified. And whatever oil you buy, be sure to buy them in small containers. As the minute you open, they start deteriorating. Anything made with soybean oil is 90% of soybean products, and that's been genetically modified or cross-contaminated. You need to stock up on whole wheat flour, bread, and pancake mixes. Many preppers grind their own wheat into flour. We have wheat stored, and the shelf life on it is 30 years, too. But it has to be used after it's opened. Wheat is chock full of fiber, protein, and vitamins and minerals. If you stock white flour, be sure to stock wheat flour in your prepper's pantry because of the nutritional value. You need flour for thickening gravies or to coat to fry things like freshly caught fish. If you have whole wheat flour, you won't have to stock genetically modified cornstarch, which is also for thickening. Consider Bob's Red Mill Whole Wheat Flour because it comes wrapped in plastic rather than in a bag. Now, what I do when I buy the flour here, two things to make sure that I don't have any weevils or anything in it is I put it in the oven on 250 degrees in the bag and I will let it heat for at least two hours. Now, watch it because you don't want to scorch the bag. If you scorch the bag, you're going to scorch the flour. If you don't want to heat it, if you've got a deep freeze, put it in the deep freeze for two weeks and you don't have any weevils. It kills everything. Cereals like shredded wheat, corn and rice, if your family eats a lot of oats, I would suggest getting your your whole oats, your round oats, and use them. Potato flour is considered good, too. Potato flour is better and it, because you can eat your veggies with it. It's better for a thickener. It's a natural dough conditioner. It's a good binder. It's good for breading, and it's a good extender. You want to use corn as a grain dried. Corn is also a vegetable and a grain. 
as a grain, corn is dried into flour to bake and make a variety of foods from cornbread to cornflakes. Corn meals, a lot of cornbread eaten. Corn starch, grits, and there's a thousand ways you can cook grits. Popcorn, masa harna, Spanish for dough. Corn is a vegetable. You can buy organic corn in cans to help ensure it's not genetically modified. In stores, look for the non-GMO product verified label. Corn is sweet, so if you're diabetic, eat it moderately. Oats and oatmeal. A favorite of the American pioneers was oatmeal. It's low in saturated fat. It's a good source of fiber. It's very important during survival times. Now, you'll need to store adequate water as making porridge requires four cups of water for every one cup of oatmeal. A tip for preparing it is to soak the oatmeal overnight so that it just takes 9 to 12 minutes to boil instead of a half an hour. You need to stock up buckets of rolled oats, bread breadcrumbs and stuffings. Those are great, too. I save all the end pieces of bread. And I freeze them, then I take them out and kind of let them air dry a little bit if I don't want to put them in, in the dehydrator. And I just crush them up, and then I put them in a jar, and I vacuum seal it with the lid. And then you just, bam, open it up when you need it. You also need to think about buying up your spices. You can cook a pot of oatmeal, and it be just oatmeal. It's kind of bland, and it's not all that great to eat, but if you've got some spices like some cinnamon, that's good to go in oatmeal. Nutmeg. You need all your spices. You need to prep those too. Let me say something else. One time in a prepper class, somebody said, I said, I don't do too many apples because Gary doesn't like apple pie. And somebody in the chat room said, wasn't this one, it was another one from years back, said, Gary will eat what Gary can get if he's hungry. That's true. We all will. But as his wife, why should I prep thousands of apples when he had rather have cherry pie or another fruit pie? You prep what your family eats. Do that. Be sure that you prep what they like to eat. That way you don't have to worry about, well, he doesn't eat this and he doesn't eat that. Now, what Gary will eat, Gary will eat applesauce. So I make homemade applesauce, can it and put it up. I make homemade pear sauce from our pear trees. I can it and put it up because it's good over gingerbread. Here's another thing they said you could do, and I'm not too great on this, but it would work in a real dire necessity is shelf-stable, ready-to-eat meals. You can buy them right in most all your grocery stores and will have beef stew, mashed potatoes. But if you turn those things over and look at them, you're going to see that they are filled with nitrates and salt. Now, salt is a preservative. Our pioneer ancestors used it. My Indian ancestors used salt because that's what they had to do. But you need to be careful about taking in too much salt. You want to prep crackers and cookies. Again, prep what your family likes. Potato flakes are great, because that's really good if you're in a hurry to uh, make a meal. You can throw the potato flakes in some water, and you've got instant mashed potatoes. Rice. Now, I think that's very, very, very important, rice, because rice can be cooked. You can eat rice for breakfast. You can eat for lunch and supper. So keep you a good source of rice. The greatest thing to do is buy your big bags of rice, save your small drink bottles, wash them real good, fill them full, cap it, then have some sealing wax and paraffin and seal the top, and that is going to last forever. And if you think about it, one small little bottle will be enough for two people. If it's a regular size bottle for water, I'm trying to remember the ounces on that, 
I think it's uh, 16 ounces. If you fill one of those up and you cook all that rice at one time, you've got rice for a whole crowd of people. And you can eat it the next day for leftovers. Pastas are great. If your family likes pastas, you need to buy those. And it would be great to be able to have a large wide mouth jar and air seal it, airtight seal it with that. That's good. Okay, you dried fruits, raisins, they're wonderful. They're chocked full of protein, iron, fiber, and vitamin C, potassium, antioxidants. Use those in a lot of cooking. Fruit leathers, fruit strips, and fruit ropes are good. Jams and jellies. Why well, make our own jam and our own jellies? And those are ready to go at any time we need to go. I do a lot of canned fruit on my own, too. And there's not as much sugar in it. Like I said, applesauce, pear sauce, pears. You can have apple rings. Now, that's another thing Gary likes. Gary likes those cinnamon apple rings. He loves those. Canned veggies. If you can't can them, go to the store and buy them because they are really, really good. Two stores on the East Coast right now is Audi's and Lidl's. Both of them are German companies, and they don't have any GMOs. Anything you buy in there, you're going you're gonna to get the real thing. Dried beans. This is very important because this is really, really good for protein. It provides a lot of energy and fiber. You can eat a lot of beans, and you don't have to eat the same kind. You can eat peas, pintos, all of them. You can have all those different beans, and they're good. Nuts, seeds, and nut butters. This is important, too, to have nuts. If you've got pecan trees, gather them up and keep them where you can get a hold of them because they're good to be putting cookies and chicken salad in a lot of dishes. Those are great. Honey. Now, it's said that if you didn't have any honey to buy it, I disagree with that. And don't go to the grocery store and get honey. It's just a tad of honey mixed in with some sugar water, and it's made of syrup. If you're going to buy honey, find somebody who has bees locally. We have a man here that has bees. We get at least three quarts of honey from him a year, and it's pretty expensive. It's about $25 a quart, but it's local, and he has his beehive. He bought a lot near his home, and you could almost put cattle in it. It's so big. And he has nothing but clover. He said clover in it. And that's where all his beehives are. And he gathers it. And then he sells it. And I don't mind paying that for it. Because I know it's really good. Now honey is also used for antibiotic topical. That is really good. Now my daddy had a place and they couldn't get it healed. And they brought a honey patch and put on it. And I watched that thing heal straight up. Also, they say it eases a sore throat. That is so. I'd rather use apple cider vinegar for a sore throat. Also, if you have a child who has allergies, if you will buy locally harvested honey and give it to your child, it helps with the allergies. And I've got a niece who had asthma, and her asthma has completely gone away because she takes a spoonful of honey every day. You need to have salt. Like I said, salt helps preserves food. It inhabits the growth of germs and the process of osmosis where it pushes water out of the microbial cells and they die. And see, the Romans did that to cure meat. Now, if you're going to can, you can stock up on canning salt, pink Himalayan salt, and Epsom salt has many health benefits. If you can, you need to get some molasses that are locally made, too. Those are really good. And if you get sugar, please go for the cane sugar, not the beet sugar. I went over your spices and herbs. Also, your condiments, pickle relish, mustard, mayo, hot sauce, soy sauce. Gary will not let soy sauce enter the house. Worcester sour sauce, maple syrup and extract, chocolates, also your vitamins. 
It doesn't have to be just your spices. You need to have some vitamins, especially vitamin C. And red pepper, cayenne pepper, that will stop bleeding. Apple cider vinegar, again, I can't tell you why it's so important to have apple cider vinegar. You can use that as a medicine. Also, you can pour it down on a cut. You're going to jump, you're going to holler, and you're going to sing, but it will work. We mentioned vodka, bourbon. You're going to need your leveling agents like baking soda and baking powder and dry yeast. And a lot of people want to store junk food. You will find that you will feel so much better if you leave the junk food alone. Just eat real good stuff like the nuts, celery. I make my own pimento cheese, my own chicken salad. I don't do anything of those additives, and you will see that you feel so much better. I want to leave you with something. As I told you, I've kind of had a real hard week here, and it's not really been an easy week for me. And Gary's caught the brunt end of it sometimes, but I wanted to read you something that my grandmother gave me a long time ago, and I'm going to leave, drop a link in there for you to listen to her favorite hymn. And I was really down one time in my, my life that was giving me a hard time, and this week's been a real hard time. And I found this just today when I was looking in my drawer, and it was a just a little note that she had written me. She said, Brenna, remember this, but God, when you chose to leave mountains unmovable, you gave me the strength to be able to sing, It Is Well With My Soul. I'll drop that in there. And this was her favorite hymn. And I have to say that it is well with my soul. I also want to say, Gary's going to end the show, but I just want to say thank you. And I want to say that I love you all big to my heart. And remember to take the road less traveled. Gary, take it over. Yeah, I think we'll leave it right there. I think that was very good. I seem to be a lot of interest in the chat room with respect to canning. So maybe we can touch that again in greater detail in a future day, perhaps, maybe. Uh, the business about communicating and a bad situation, I guess we'll just have to push that off to another week because I don't think it would fit in well with uh, where we ended up. Anyway, take care. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you later. Bye-bye.